Before I take this, let's look at question number two. Question number two says, what does Zen mean by the advantages of combining paternalism with command? It's a really basic question. Or is it? What's paternalism? Yes. You're on the right track. So that uh, in paternal is not like a father would do. Paternalism means like a father. Oh, okay. So like the idea is you think of an idea like you're know, somebody who knows better than you, and you want to do something, but no, no, you can't. This is what's best for you. And if you it, so that somebody on top, and the big thing about paternalism, that implies that there's a natural hierarchy. Some people are on the bottom, some people are there, and some people are on top. And they know whether or not, so they have the right to, to tell us what to do and we must obey. So you know, that's what it is. So it's like a paternal pattern to be followed. Like paternalism. So that's what it means. And so it's implying that we're in command, but I'm saying you must follow me because you don't know anything and I know what's best for you. Okay, when you're a little child, that kind of does make sense because you're learning you don't know. Isn't that a great way for someone on top to just take advantage of people? Yeah. But if you didn't know what paternalism means, you couldn't answer that question. If you thought it was something else. And so if you learn it like that, it's somebody claiming they know what's best, does that potentially change your answer? Yeah. Let's look at the next question. The next question says, Zinn argues that it was not a conscious conspiracy, but an accumulation of tactical responses. But what's a conspiracy? Yes. Um, it's like a group of people who plan You're on the right track. You're on the right track, but not completely. You're on the right track. They might do harm, but it's more common. That could be a an effect of it, but not necessarily. That's not it. Yes. Okay. Say so now you're kind of thinking a conspiracy theory. Yeah. Yeah. So once again, you're on the right track, but not quite. And now we're like, <laughs> a conspiracy is a crime committed by more than one person. That's all a conspiracy is. It's a crime committed by more than one person. So it could cause harm. And it could be that, but it's not necessarily. It's a crime. And what's the crime? Treason. If these are people getting together to commit treason. It's a crime committed by more than one person. And so a conscious conspiracy means they know it and they're planning this and organizing this. And what is the conspiracy? To overthrow the crown and declare independence. And was that what's going on? Yes. Um, then why would a conspiracy theory call it a conspiracy theory? Conspiracy is murder. Because sometimes it might be a crime, but also because words are misused all the time. And so conspiracy theory, most of the time it's people are misusing the And don't know they're misusing it. And that's an issue. Here's another one. What does tactical mean? Hmm? The exact opposite. No. I know that's horrible of me to say. A conscious conspiracy could be strategic. That a long term plan. Tactical is what? Not. Say it again. Yeah, a reaction. So you might have like prepared and trained, but tactically think of you know think of like military. So strategic is like your long-term plan for victory. Tactics would be okay. Let's say your plan is to attack the enemy with your right. Yet they attack on your left. Oh no! So your tactical response: pull troops from your right to stop them. Short-term response. It's not a long-term plan. Strategic is long-term. But by saying that, that's really common people think because it sounds like the same thing. 
without changing anyone's answer. Yeah, if you don't know what the words mean, you can't answer the question. If you don't know stuff, you cannot think clearly. You cannot think critically. You can't. It doesn't happen if you don't know stuff. If you don't know stuff, that means that people will take advantage of you because then they can manipulate you and take advantage of what you don't know. I mean, think how easy it would have been for me to manipulate you because you misunderstood those words. Think how easy it would have been, especially if I positioned a very paternalistic position of doing what's best for you, right? And you trusted me. So rule one, don't trust. No. But actually, rule one is be skeptical. But you have to know stuff. If you don't know things, you cannot think critically. It doesn't matter how smart you are, and all of you are smart. All of you are capable, you write well, you, you're, you are motivated, you want to do well. But if you don't know what you're doing, you won't do well. And don't think you can look it up. Because if you gotta look something up, you're already sunk. Because I've been doing this for a long time. It's always amazing to me when we get a series of questions like multiple choice questions. And this happens all the time. Where somebody misses like four or five in a row. And then why would they miss four or five in a row? Including easy ones. And I always think that they have trouble with one and they're whole there's all their things in mind. And it makes them mad. And it messes up the reading of the next few that they come out of. The same thing is, by the way, my guess is all of you have done that. That's why if there's one question you don't know, move on as quickly as possible. Don't think about it. Come back. No, no, think about that thing. If not, that's guess. If you don't know something, you're thinking about what you don't know. If you're looking up something, you're thinking about what we don't know and not what we know. And you're already sunk. And think when things happen fast and you don't know. That's when you can take the knowledge. You will. And so you can't answer questions like this unless you know. Of course, I'm not saying you have to know everything. And yes, you're going to miss stuff. But the more you know, the better off you will be. Just like with those short IDs when I say it's not enough to just simply know like a few basic little tidbits, you have to connect it to something. That's how you remember. That's how you know. That's how you draw things back. So, this is what I'm going to do. If you mess that up and did not get it because you did not answer it correctly, I'll give you one more day. Get it to me right. I want a better answer. You answered it correctly with the conscious conspiracy being a long-term plan, a tactical short-term. I will check. But if not, give it to me tomorrow. Sound good? All right. So, if you want to give it to me, give it to the class, everyone else, just put it away for now and I'll talk to you tomorrow. Sound good? So put it away now. If you have it done, if you answered it correctly, so the paternalism was this kind of I know better than, than you, looking at what's for best, but it's a way to kind of manipulate. By the way, me telling you that, you think I'm looking out for you, correct? So teaching is kind of paternalism. That am I looking out for you? Actually, I kind of am. And you can trust me because I'm telling you. That's the beginning of the see. Yes. Paternalism is more muddled. And so the idea is that it's not that you're doing what's best for you, or I'm telling you what's best. So, like, somehow, like, in a way, almost like teaching. So, actually, it's like teaching is both. You know, sometimes you have to. And just think about the term, uh, think about the way the Romans would have looked at what the people were caught in the panel. That's the way they look at it. Anybody want to give it to me? Everyone else, if you have it, just. But that means you trust it, you answer it correctly. All right. So, so it works good then with the tack, all right?
And if you have to change, it's not that big of a deal. But I'm going to say this one more time, and I'll say this, all, I'll say this again, though. It's time you, you know stuff. It's time you know stuff. Don't be the one who doesn't know. Don't be that person. Because they're out there. And you both will have the same number of votes you do. You get a pond that. I, I am very scared that I won't know stuff, so I'm always trying to learn. Speaking of that, where did we quit here? Um, yeah. So we're here. Oh, did we got the we got the Port Duquesne, didn't we? Yes. Oh, we got the Jumanville. So we're in Jumanville. And we got the Frencher there, we got status quo, we got tree, all, all that. All right, let's go. We got Washington, the Mingos. We're here. We're here? Yeah. So, Jumanville was on a mission of peace. Are we good on that? Yeah. Did I say Washington ambush him, attack him? Yeah. Yeah, Washington, I mean, this is such a foolish move, but he also wanted the glory of this one, right? About the glory of the whizzing bullets by my ear. He kind of had this aura that he was never going to get killed. The Battle of Trenton, a bullet went literally, or the Battle of Princeton went right through his head, right through his head. I'm sorry. <laughs> went right through his, his hat. So miss his head about that much. Singed his hair. He just had that aura. At least he thought he did. And so they ambushed the Canadians. That's another term for the French. And there's a bloody shark fight. Here's a very stylized picture of that. And I love this one, like, that's supposed to be Washington. You see a lot of paintings like this of Washington, too. And it's supposed to be Washington during this war. Yet it's Washington and the Revolutionary War. So they always have an older Washington fighting back when he was 22. I always think that's kind of funny. Of course, Washington is perpetually kind of an old man on the dollar bill. And so with that, Jumanville's captured. And now Washington has no idea what to do. Yeah, he ordered the attack. Now what? Interrogate. Figure out what he knows about the French at Duquesne. So imagine in this really heavily forested area, sun is going down. They got a few fires flickering. Their men are wounded. They're, they're gasping and moaning in pain. There's a group of French and a few uh, Seneca that are captured. And there's Schumanville, hands tied behind his back, on his knees. And Washington is facing him, trying trying to get him to say, how many men are Duquesne? So he's how many men? And Jumanville, Jumanville responds. What's the problem? Yeah, Jumanville speaking in French. Washington speaking in English. So what does Washington do? You're not answering me, so he yells louder in English. Jumanville yells in French. So they're screaming at each other back and forth. And nothing's going to resolve. And this is pretty calm. You, know, you can't speak my language. What if I yell it louder? You'll understand. Well, Half King was a Mingo, one of the um, um, one of the from the Eastern tribe that joined Washington's forces. He's with Washington, and Half King is sitting back there, not really understanding either, but getting mad. This is going nowhere. We were sent here to get a little glory and capture stuff from the French. He's holding a war club. So imagine a, a stick, a, a pretty thick, heavy oaken branch, about that thick, smooth, about this long. And then a polished rock about this big is tied to one end. So it's a little bump kind of thing. A war club. He's holding this, kind of watching this. And you know, imagine him, he's there, he's just basically one just a, a loin cloth. That's it. But he's watching it, and you're gonna be uh joining him. Okay. So you act like you don't you don't know if something's gonna hit you. Okay. He's standing holding this, watching and yelling at him, and without any warning. Half King just go literally in the middle of Jumanville's yelling back, middle of war, bang! Takes that war club across his skull, thus ending the argument. Blood goes everywhere. Washington is covered with blood. Jumanville goes down on the ground. People just start screaming. Then Half King comes over to the body, takes his foot on the skull that's split apart, grabs hold of it, rips it apart, pulls out the brain and begins to wash himself with it. 
pandemonium ensues. You'd be ah, running around, you have to go, yeah, doing this. By the way, that's fatal. Jumaville didn't make it. And, but if you and French escape and run back to Duquesne, Washington will be like, I'm done, I'm done. What did I screw up? What have I just done? Now, Washington will later say that Jumaville died in the battle, but no, he was murdered when Washington was in command. Now, Washington didn't want to murder, but it's his fault. So what does he do? He runs to what's called the Great Plain or the Great Clearing and builds a fort. And you know you're in trouble. Oh, I forgot to put that down, half king in war. That's starting the war. So this is what I, the story I just told you. You won't need to know the exact detail. I mean, you just know Washington started it. And he runs to the valley. They begin to construct a fort in the worst place possible, the bottom of a valley. So the French and the Seneca and the Shawnee can get in the hill to shoot down on them. He forgot to put it on a little creek so he had no water. People tend to need water. And when you're in trouble, he called the fort Fort Necessity. That's a bad sign. It's now a, na uh, a National Historical Site, and they rebuilt the fort, and it's just this little, tiny little wooden stockade. And the Virginians are crammed into this. Well, Washington is quickly surrounded. So the French surround the Virginians, or the British, however you want to look at it. And Washington, after a sharp fight, would surrender. And this is a hard decision for Washington. Because if he surrenders, he goes back to the square. And remember, he wanted to be rich, become an officer. Is that going to happen? This is desperation. Of course, he made the logical decision. Uh, if I fight to the death, I wouldn't get that stuff either. So they surrendered. Now, it was very normal to surrender with terms. That was the norm. So basically, as you we agree to end the fight, Washington agreed, okay, you win. No more fighting, nobody else has to die. And a very common thing would be, you know, you get the land and you agree to let it just go home. That's a term or a condition. And that's really common. Now, rarely this happens, but occasionally the victor, the side winning, will say no, no terms. Unconditional surrender, no conditions. And we dictate what happens. That's pretty rare. Because if somebody says, we were fighting to the finish, they figure, well, let's fight to the death. I have no choice. Unconditional surrender will have big implications down the road. Big implications. Not here, we're talking World War II. But, anyways, Washington's right. So the French gave him terms. So they gave him a piece of paper. Two terms, right? Turn it off. Written out for Washington. Washington, read it. Washington. And sign. Huh? What's the problem? By the way, this is the actual, that's the signature right there. It's in French. He had no idea what he was reading. No idea. But he didn't want to admit it, so he acted like he knew. Now, he would later on say, oh, I knew. No, no, he had no idea. And in it, they wrote not only that Washington ordered the execution of Jude. But he got his orders from the royal governor of Virginia and King George II of England. None of that is true, but he signed it. And so that would be what's called the Castle's Battle, or the cause of war. Now, the war was going to happen in England. You know, France, France was looking for a preventative war. But still, therefore, you, therefore, we can blame Washington for this worldwide war that would eventually lead to a series of events that would make Washington the first president of a new country called the United States. So that was his conscious conspiracy. Obviously not. So that's how it all started. So we got this down, the French, he made the assassination. It's a big deal. And Washington's humiliated, they walked back, an embarrassment. It went back to England, and now England's mad. And England is going to send. Oh, and that would be the beginning of what we call the French and Indian War. And we already wrote that down, right? So we're going to skip ahead to this. 1755, the British sent a crack regiment of soldiers under General William Braddock. Braddock was a veteran, and he had been fighting war after war on the continent. So a regiment's over 1,000 troops. Washington got a second chance, a rare thing. Because he knew the terrain, 
he would lead about 200 militia and be Braddock's adjutant. But Braddock looked at Washington as this hick, this country bumpkin. That's actually what they would have said. These colonials are dumb. They don't know what to do. So he thought, he thought Washington was kind of fun. It was big branch. But they're going to march overland from Virginia back to Fort Duquesne. Now, the French, they have been fighting there for a very long time, and they had adopted tactics that would be known 40 years later, what we call today guerrilla tactics. And that's how you spoke guerrilla. Don't write it with an O, G O R. That's a different thing. Guerrilla Spanish, you might know what guerrilla tactics mean. You know? If I say guerrilla tactics, yeah, that's kind of what everyone does, but yeah. Oh, yeah, but they're like the massive. Yeah, they're, they're usually smaller forces, so they do like ambush, hit and run. If a bigger force comes, they might you know, uh, retreat back into the woods. And so they attack, hit and run, ambush. Guerrilla tactics. And guerrilla tactics, you know, that is what smaller armies do if they're not as strong. And you don't need to win, you just need to survive. Just survive. Because eventually the stronger force would say it's not worth it anymore and go home. That's how the U.S. would become independent. And even the most powerful country in the world, like Britain, would get beaten by a tiny little guerrilla army. Or the most powerful country in the world today would get beaten by a guerrilla army. Because eventually they go home. That just happened. Again. So with that, oh. So here's the British, and it shows them marching through the forest. You know, we've got about 1,500 total men. You notice how they have a line of about eight feet? Most of it was a road cut through the forest that's slightly wider than this. So maybe two abreast. 1,500 men, two abreast. How long is that line? That's over a mile snaking its way through the forest. And Washington said, you can ambush. That's how they attack. They'll ambush in the mountains. They'll hit and run. They'll peck away, chip away. In you know, Vietnam, they would call it ambush hell. That's what it is. And Braddock said, you dummies, you don't know how to fight. We know how to fight. By the way, I thought I put up a picture of a Shawnee. And if people in the United States say, look at that hairdo, what do we call that? Mohawks. And the Mohawks did not wear their hair like that. World War II, they have no idea. And paratroopers were training that they land behind enemy lines and use those kind of tactics. And so they would, you know, they put black on their face and they would, they would put on what they said is they're putting on their war paint, but they're copying the Western movies that were really popular at that time. When they jumped out of planes, they would yell Geronimo in World War II, who was an Apache chief from what is now Arizona, which makes no sense, but they just did it. And they wanted to cut their hair like that, and they thought they'd cut it, and they thought Mohawk sounded cool, so they cut their hair like that. They didn't wear their hat on. Mohawks wore slightly different. No hair here. For them. Hair here. And how would they get rid of this hair? You're an adult. And, you know, 50, 50 years old. You'd run the gauntlet. You know what the gauntlet is. You'd run through the lines of men, and they would beat you. As you go through and you gotta get past while they beat you. And then when you're done, you get your hair cut. Now your hair is the right length. So this is going to hurt you. They would grab big hunks of it and rip it up. When you grab that, what's it gonna take along with the hair? All the way to the skull. All the way to the skull. And so they have this <laughs> just this basically a scar here. And that would be their haircut. By the way, why do that? Well, it is a rite of passage, but there's one more thing too. They scout. They can't scout. They would scout. They would scout. That almost certainly came from the tribe. They rarely did. They didn't fight that kind of war in the finish, but that, that prevented scouting. So they can't get that trophy of victory. No, no, we're saying, yeah, they can't, they just cut around right here. <laughs> Let's not think about that. Moving on. So, Braddock, though, 
thought, I am trained, experienced soldier. We have fought on the frontier. These bunch of primitives or colonials, they can't beat us. They don't know. Because 18th century fighting in Europe, they thought they understood fighting. The tactics was very basic. Because of the limitations in weapons and black powder, they would line up in lines. So here's a British line, two abreast, so you can have two lines firing. While the front line fired, the back line could load. Here are the Prussian soldiers on the march in lines, straight lines. And they had to go to about 50 yards. Why? The brown vest musket right here, you can load it about three times a minute if you're really good. It's muzzle loading, so you have to drop the musket ball down the barrel. It's smooth bore. Do you know what I mean when I mean rifle? Yeah, what's rifle? It's when you take a cut out of the barrel and then pull it straight. Yeah, like a little groove that kind of spirals. If the bullet spins, it's more accurate. The problem is, if you're loading from the from the top, it's really hard to load a musket ball because it's got to be a tight fit. It takes a long time. Smooth bore, the musket ball is a little bit bigger than you drop it down. So what? How accurate is that thing going to be? Uh, 50 yards, you could hit a, a barn, maybe the school. So do you see why they had to line it line it together? One person shooting really inaccurate. But if they all shoot together, you're going to hit something. The problem is, at 50 yards or 40 yards, the enemy's doing the same thing. And at 40 yards, you can see their face. You can see their eyes. And black powder doesn't push the bullets very fast. So you can actually see the bullets sometimes. It kind of becomes like an image, like a word on the body. Do you see a problem? How long would rational people stand 40 yards away from somebody who's shooting at their face with a muscle? What would rational people do? What? Gone, right? That's what rational people do. And so they're going to be lined up in these rows, and what's discipline going to be like for these regular soldiers? For the most minor offense, they're going to be whipped. I mean, when I mean minor offense, like you're in line practicing and you turn your head, that could be up to 50 lashes. You drop your bayonet, bayonet where you add a blade to the end of your physical point <laughs> to make your musket into a spear, into a pike. You drop that, heck, that could be 100 lashes. For the most minor offense, they're lashed. Why? They're more scared of their officers than the enemy shooting in their face. So discipline is harsh in the middle. We get out the way to the 1900s. Why? They want people to be irrational. If you know anything about the military today, you heard your know, basic training can be difficult. That's why. They're beating out your rationality and teaching you to be irrational. You've got to be irrational to do that. I don't know any other way, but yeah, that's what they do. So, oh, one more thing, why are they wearing the brightly colored uniforms? Because black powder is so smoky, you can't see. So you can identify. Why do the British use red? I always get every class, when somebody's thinking, the height of the blood. No. <laughs> no! Did you say that? <laughs> Cromwell, during the Civil War, wanted to have a uniform in all one color, and he got a bunch of red fabric for, fabric for uh, cheap. So brown. That, just such a, really, that's it? Just cheap fabric? Why not? But how did the French dress? Just like the American Indians. Camouflage, right? Either skins or naked, essentially. But naked and tan, pretty good camouflage. They hid. They shot and run away. That's so totally unfair. By the way, you're right about in regular battles. But not in the countryside. And so to their point of view, they cheated. But Braddock got more brushing. Washington warned him. Warned him and warned him. 
But you dummy. So, at the Battle of the Mahongahia, which is pretty near Fort Duquesne, this long line of French soldiers, over a mile long, were ambushed, broken up into pieces. Braddock couldn't rally them. There's no big night broad fields where he get his line organized. It's mountains. And it was a disaster, an absolute slaughter. A third of his men down, including Braddock. Now, Washington would rally forces and then two thirds would escape. But nobody gets credit in a disaster. And Washington would never forget this. So here's a picture of basically Seneca fighting the British. Here's Braddock, supposedly kind of a dramatic picture of him before he was killed. He's a warrior. Humiliating defeat. Washington would fight in the militia, Virginia militia, all in this area for the rest of the war. But he never got the credit he deserved. He would get the land and would marry the wealthiest widow in Virginia. He would get his money. But he never forgot, as he saw, the disrespect of British show. And there's nothing more corrosive than somebody who feels slighted. If you feel like you're not getting the respect you deserve, it just builds and festers and grows. And that's why Washington felt towards the British. I'm sure that we've all done that, to be very fair. I guess you've all felt slighted by somebody and you've been angry for a really long time. Or you don't realize you did something to somebody and you thought, why are they mad at me? I don't know. Investors and grow. It's a dangerous thing. The feeling of disrespect. And so with that, by the way, that is a great name, the Mahangahia. Once you get past for what the wind really picked up. This area is really pretty river once you get past the big cities. And thus uh, uh, would begin the Seven Years' War. The Seven Years' War would begin, and though this happened, yes, triggered by the French and Indian War, but the main elements of it would be in this area of Europe, especially Prussia. This kingdom, which eventually their king would become the first emperor of what we call Germany today. So they're Germans, but there's no Germany yet. They'd be fighting the French. So now the French are occupied here. And so the British have this great advantage. They can pick off pieces of France. And the war is going to be fought all over here, off of Gibraltar. There's going to be a big naval battle off of South, what is now South Africa. Massey fights in India, including one of the most important battles in history called the Battle of Plessy. But the French are occupied. And the other big problem the French have the Royal Navy makes it very difficult to resupply their forces here. <laughs> the French have a powerful fleet here, but when it sailed out from Martinique in 1758, over 100 ships, including about 20 battleships, and all ships of the water. When they sailed out, remember these were sailing vessels with triple mast, all the rigging, you know, these are complex ships. This time of year, What's going on this time of year in the Caribbean? Right now, hurricanes. How did you know a hurricane was coming in 1758? 100 mile per hour winds. Just all of a sudden smashes into you and the entire fleet was destroyed in the hurricane. Now you might think, that's an interesting story that will have direct effect on the creation of the United States. Thank you, hurricanes. And on that note, I need a drink. See, now watch me drink. Isn't that exciting? You know, you get everything here. Life lessons. What, what life lessons did I? What life lesson did I give you yesterday? Don't marry your yeah, don't marry your cousin. See, they just flow out of me. Well, Britain would organize for war. And this was a wrap. This war, the Seven Years' War, was like, like a hinge moment where everything in Europe changed. Everything around the world changed. There really was this hinge moment. Well, the leading minister of parliament was soon called the prime minister. It was William Pitt. Sometimes you see him called William Pitt the Elder. And Pitt organized Britain for victory. And what did he see? Let's just give money to Prussia. If Prussia keeps fighting, France is preoccupied. And so Frederick the Great, the king of Prussia, 
outnumbered, but kept Russia, Prussia, and Austria occupied while well, Britain then could pick off colonies. And by 1758, the French had to evacuate Duquesne. They blew up the main stores with black powder, and colonial militia took Fort Duquesne. So the French are kind of pulling back now. I should add that uh, the British immediately rebuilt the fort. And what did they call the fort? Anyone know? Fort Pitt. Does anybody want to guess what city formed around Fort Pitt? Yeah, Cleveland. And so, yes, yeah, Pittsburgh. All bird me German city. German people. And so with that, and then what about debt? The hell with it. They're going to issue bonds and run up a huge debt. And when will they worry about paying it back? When the war is over. When the war is over, we'll pay it back. Because you can't pay it back when the war is won. The problem is, it's a close one thing. So interest rates are going to go up. And when I mean pay it back, they're not going to pay it back. You know, Britain has never paid back that debt totally. You want to get your interest rates down. That's what it means. The problem is they got to be repaid in gold. So when the war ends, they're going to have to get gold. And where are they going to try to get gold from? Colonies. Remember the colonies? Remember salutary neglect? We'll make them pay. The steps to war are happening. The French hold out to the treaty. Remember status quo? Just hold out. <laughs> hold out. There will be a treaty. So that's the basic element of war. The France hold up. And so it's a really confusing war in Europe. The British are doing really well in India, but the French are holding out because I to give this, but that's New France here. And this is in Canada. I don't know if you know this, but winters can be hard in Canada. And this is still the time of the mini ice age. So basically there's only a few months of the year that you could really campaign in. Canada. So the British are going to have to try to drive them out. And they're going to try a massive operation leading to one of the most important battles in American history, U.S. history, and it didn't happen in the U.S. The Battle of Quebec. September 1759. And it's pretty remarkable. Think about it. This would affect our history to this day. If the French would have won, there would have been no United States. At least nothing like we know. This wouldn't have happened if the French would have won. Totally different course of history. And there were maybe 200 colonial militia there. It's mostly about 4,500 to 5,000 British soldiers and French soldiers and militia. That's it. But they would decide our entire history. So I've got to tell you a couple stories about this battle. They sailed up the St. Lawrence River. Think about how hard it would be to sail a boat. So that means tacking like this up a river, especially a river that's over a mile wide. The St. Lawrence is huge. There's so much more water there. Yeah, this Quebec has the biggest freshwater storage in the world, most freshwater of the in the world. So, kind of like Montana. So, and then Quebec is on this little peninsula. They have a fort on these high cliffs, and these cliffs go anywhere from 50 to 100 feet high for miles upstream. Here is a swampy area with this kind of marshy uh, St. Charles River. So it's going to be really almost impossible to attack this way. And how do you get up the cliffs? If the, if the French can just sit in their fort, they can win the whole battle. The British commander is the most famous British general in one of the most famous, maybe the most famous, General James Wolfe, 36 years old, Wolfe. And Wolfe, if you go to like the British Military Academy, uh, Sandhurst, I mean, there are pictures of Wolfe there, Wolfe, there's a big statue. He's, he is the most famous general. When you go to St. Paul's Cathedral in London, which is kind of like the church of Britain, there's huge monuments to Wolfe. The French commander was Montcalm, right here. Montcalm. He was more of a politician, very able politician, not a great general. 
Malcolm, all he had to do was hold out till winter. The British couldn't sail up the river till July. And they basically had to either have victory or retreat by October. Because if they're caught in the winter in Quebec, they're dead. Does that make sense? So they got to win. So they got to find a way up that cliff. So this is why Wolfe is going to be considered one of the greats in British military history. And the fate of the United States. No, they did not know it at the time, but. So, a couple of things. First off, here's going to be a watercolor of the British scrambling up the cliff, but it wasn't quite like that. Here is the fort. Now, I've not been to Quebec. We were going to go, my wife and I, last year. Last spring break, we were thinking about going there in Montreal. Something was going on. I don't even remember last year. Kind of a blur. Uh, my wife and I are very frugal. We save money. But anyway, here's the cliffs looking on the other side of St. Lawrence. St. Lawrence is over a mile wide. And these cliffs go on for miles. They're sheer. They're impossible to get up. Oh, sure. A few people can climb up, but you probably are going to climb up with equipment with horses you can. And so that is Wolf's problem. That was Wolf's problem. It's not his problem anymore. So the British are going to have, they're going to land about 5,000 men. They're going to land, they sail past Quebec, about past the gun, and they land this little cove here, right here. So it's a little clearing and then cliffs. And it's anywhere from 50 to 60 feet high. There are a few little gulches, but for the most part, they're going to have to get up almost 50 feet up before they can actually kind of start scrambling over. Well, British pickets. We're noticing something. French women from the top of the cliff were somehow getting to the bottom and washing their clothes in the river. How are they getting up and down? Going in September, one British picket noticed what looked like French women floating down the cliff in the fog. You kind of look up there floating down. So the first time I actually saw them, what were they? Witches. Right? And so instead of like a costume, that's what he hit. And when they went back up, he went to that spot, and unless you were literally standing on it, you couldn't see this little trail. That was basically a mountain boat trail that they kind of widened just a little bit, about this wide, switched back in this way, almost 50 feet up to a little gully with the gap. Wolf heard about it and ordered the next night all 4,000 of his men to go up. I always imagine those guys, just imagine the middle of the night, pitch black, except for the first men went up and they hung ropes with torches down, how dark it would have been, and you're carrying your gear, you have a backpack, and your musket, which must have been. And I was thinking about them, like, on the side of the cliff, kind of like going up the cliff, and you got all 4,000, only a few fell. How do you get the horses and cannon up? Catapults, the cat Yeah, <laughs> they set up kind of a pulley system when they pulled the four horses up. And Malcolm was shocked to see over 4,000 British soldiers on the plains, on the plains of Abraham, in front of Quebec. They weren't supposed to be there. And now they're finding like a traditional British army that their line stretched out. It's going to be a slugfest like it was in Europe. Malcolm should have stayed in his gates, but instead he went out with his troops to fight. Half of his men were militia, and the militia he put in both flanks. But when the and they ordered an attack, thinking if Malcolm thought if I win this battle, I'll defeat the British from now on. The problem was when they began to push forward, Malcolm was mortally wounded. All of his men, especially the militia, saw he was wounded, and so they're oh my God, our leader's dead, and now the British are firing in their faces. And what do they do? Gone. They took off running. Because that's what militia always did. They don't have that same training. And they decided, you know, I kind of want to live. Yeah. And what happened to the French line? The French line was rolled up and turned into a decisive British victory. Decisive. Like changing the world decisively. 
Ironically, at almost the same time, Wolfe was mortally wounded. But the British stayed and fought. And let me show you one more thing really quick. See this? This is one of the most famous paintings, and that's Wolfe dying. Right there, he was hit in the gut. And he was dying. And you see Wolfe's face? How old does Wolfe look there? Portrait painters at that time would smooth out the faces. And so anybody, male or female, if they're under the age of, let's say, 35, they look like a junior high age girl. <laughs> anybody over that age, they look like kind of a major lead senior citizen age woman. Male or female, they all look like that. I'll show you more pictures down the road. Decisive victory, and here's kind of a combination. These are a picture of the French. This kind of weird group of people. Let me add a couple more things here for the Belgians. I know the Belgians right away, but I'm not quite done. That's the price you pay. This would lead, eventually Montreal would fall. There'd be some fighting, it's not completely over. There's fighting in Europe, but finally both sides exhausted. They would meet in Paris. When in doubt, if somebody asks you a treat, a treaty or a treaty, put down Paris. There's so many treaties negotiated in Paris, and that luck would have it, there are two treaties for of Paris in this unit. 1763 and 1783. Remember, I told you you don't necessarily need to know every date, but you've got to know the difference between these two treaties. This one would end this war, a clear British victory. And let me just get through this very quickly. What's the victory? Britain got all this land, all of it, including Spanish Florida for 20 years. That's a massive victory. The French kept three islands. You don't need to know the islands now, and I always forget the islands, so I wrote them down so I can look at them. So I always remember Guadalupe and Martinique, but I always forget Santa Lucia, and I don't know why. Now, the West Indies are what they call the that's why I typed it today, we would say the Caribbean. The French actually could have kept New France or kept the Caribbean islands. What crop, though, was so valuable at that time it was more valuable than Canada? What crop in the West Indies? Yeah, sugar. Now, we know today, not a good deal. These islands would be decisive in the victory of the United States. And... Lastly, Spain got the claim to Louisiana. France didn't want Britain to get it. So they gave the claim. What's Louisiana? All the drainage of the Missouri River. You are sitting on that land claim. So the British did not get it. Now, eventually, the Spanish would give it back in a treaty, and then Napoleon would sell that. I'll tell you all that story down the road, that claim. A massive victory. This is huge. The British also got India. I mean, massive victory. And so with that, we'll quick. A few results. I got to tell you about one thing and then watch the video. So does everyone have, tomorrow you have to have that packet, that bacon rebellion, you know what I'm talking about. Please have that tomorrow. And we're going to do a couple notes and then we'll watch the video. Anybody who Want to redo their questions for Zen? Please get that back to me. And is there anything else? All right. Have a good day. Right when you find work, I'm really hungry. We should have a snack. Though. Fourth period gets difficult. Have a good day. A and M. Oh, yeah. Hey. Have a good day. Oh, ruler. Whose stuff is that? Who's is there? See you tomorrow.
time. Let's see, what do I need? Oh, I'll check this off. I was filming last period, so whatever you did, I'll share. 